Sorry. Do you think that uh, Cody's behavior, uh, especially after her book came out, had anything to do with perhaps exacerbating maybe her withdrawal? I think you can, without talking to her directly, I think you can speculate that here was this very close to, I mean, think about the friendship, the two of them in this teeny town, you know, and they were very dear to one another. And it's, when you look at darling little Truman, it's really kind of heartbreaking to think about what happened to them. I think you can draw your own conclusion that that kind of life that he began to lead was sort of an abject lesson in what not to become. So I'm sure it contributed, I mean, I think it contributed, but without talking to her, I would not have no idea. I mean, drawing a line in 1964, drawing a line in the sand with the press, that I mean, that's a very scout kind of stubborn move, if you think about it. Did her, did her sister speculate on that at all? Her sister just... Well, she said what she said in, in the movie. Um, so, you know, and, and I think, I like when she says she did not change her rule. So, here, in the gray. Um, the preponderance of people you ended up interviewing were white, um, and uh, there were maybe three African Americans. Right. I wondered whether your conclusion, sort of interviewing and talking to a lot of people, is that this is, book is more about, had an impact on the white understanding of those times versus I think it, I think in a lot of ways it did. Um, there were there were people that said they'd interview. There were a couple of prominent um, black people who agreed to be interviewed, but I could never schedule. And that and so Maya Angelou was supposed to talk to me, but she never could. They, I could never schedule. John Lewis was the other person. Um, but I think what Mark Childress says is really important that it gave white people a way to think about what was going on. It's something Tom Brokaw says in his interview that's in the book but not in here is her really helped liberate white people, really. I mean, and, and that that was an important aspect of the civil rights movement. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think it had a great effect on, and white northerners, I think it had a great effect on. Ma'am? Are you able to uh, keep creative control over something once before it gets distributed when you go to other people? And something like this obviously spent a lot of time doing this. How, how much did that uh, impact when you have to go to a distributor? And do they change it a lot? The distributor I'm talking about do doesn't, I love them because they don't want to change anything. Um, but I think if you're going to get a broadcast, say, my per personal dream would be American Masters on PBS because I think it's a, that, that is going to have a time constraint. So you're going to have to cut it down for time, but a PBS hour, unlike a network hour, which is like now 35 minutes once you're done with commercials, a PBS hour is really maybe 54 minutes, so. Would you be involved in that or someone else takes over? Oh, no, I, w I, w I would be. I mean, one of the reasons I'm so deeply broke is because I wouldn't let anyone touch <laughs> <laughs> Roberta. Well, I would love to congratulate you. Thank you. Oh, um, well, I, the, my adult reading of To Kill a Mockingbird made a far greater impression on me than, any, than at any other time. And, um, and, and when I sort of had this idea, I was a producer at CBS News, and I pitched it to Steve Croft, who I worked with at 60 Minutes, and he kept saying, if you don't get Harper Lee, go get Harper Lee. Come back to me when you have Harper Lee. And, yeah, I mean, he was nice about it, but still, I... I you know, it was, and, and everyone kept saying there's no news value to this unless you unless you talk to Harper Lee. Well, as you can see, she wasn't talking to Oprah. Chances are, she, uh, for, you know, <laughs> chances were talking to me didn't seem good either. So, um, so I would sort of cease and desist and go about my business and pitch it again two years later to somebody new. Like Sunday morning, I, when I went there, I thought, okay, we could do J.D. Salinger and Harper Lee, and we could explore these two. And everyone kept saying, eh. so it wasn't until I left. Um, the confines of a news organization that I began to think about it as something different. And I read the novel when I left CBS News and I began to, I had already done a lot of reporting on Harper Lee. I knew a lot about May Monroeville. And I, I, I had a bunch of stuff already. And I began to see that the story was really the novel. The story was the impact of the novel and the fact that it's such an incredible phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. I mean, it's, there's nothing like it. I don't think there will be another book 
that does that's like this. I haven't seen one. You know, there, there's not another one that I can name. So, um, so that's when I began to see that I could do something with this. Um, it was really, really hard. I mean, I won't be attempting anything like this again soon. But, but, um, but you know, in retrospect, I see that it was about conscience and integrity and that mental, mental ought to me. And I'm really glad that I was able to do it. And I also think it's about which is also very important to me. I think it's about the transforming power of reading, you know, and I think it's why we read. We read books, you know, to be elevated, and this is one of those books in, in the back. What did you think of the critical article in the New York? I would like to arm wrestle Malcolm Gladwell to the ground on that um, issue, but, but I, um, and I found it very surprising because that article to me seemed to suggest that, that Atticus Finch was supposed to be some kind of crusading civil rights attorney when in fact it's set in the Depression and he's not, a, you know, I mean this is not this is not set in the 60s, it's set in the Depression it's a court appointed case and what Atticus really did was vigorously defend Tom Robinson that's what he did that was shocking to his neighbors, I mean other court appointed lawyers would have just not lifted a finger and the result probably would have been the same, but I was very surprised by that um, interpretation and it seemed to me to be trying to gin up a controversy where there wasn't exactly one. And there's some I can get I can get into the weeds about some some of the facts there, but I won't. <laughs> yeah. Um, you had me in tears. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Boo Radley is or uh, uh, Hey Boo is such a perfect title for this. Did you? Go through other incarnations for a time. No, I, I really, um, and I really, uh, I have to thank Tom, Tom Brokaw for this because I worked with him on another documentary, and um, I told him what I was up to, and he told me that you know, and then he started, he started whenever he called me, he'd say, "Hey, boo," and um, he really got me thinking about it first, and then of course when Oprah had her, I mean it just works on so many levels and so no I never called it anything else. <laughs> Sir? I was wondering if Oprah's contribution came with any business strings attached because it uh -huh. seems like she would, this would be perfect for airing on her new TV channel. Yeah, it's right. too bad they said no. Oh um, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, and that was a situation where, you know, Oprah had been on record, she was on my list early on because, you know, she has always said it's one of her favorite books so you know, she said that like a hundred times, so of course I had to write to her a hundred times to see if she would do it. But, um, I, you know, I, I think some people think this is too old-fashioned or too talking heady and not edgy enough for what they're up to. But I'm very grateful that she participated because I think she's, her contribution is great. In the back? Do you know or have you been told Harper Lee's thoughts on you making it? Uh, the question is, do I know or have I been told? Miss um, Alice, um, her really de has macular degeneration, so she's not, she can't read that well. And Miss Alice told me that she read her parts of my book, so she didn't say, you know, that she loved it or anything. But she, but I, she does know it exists, and um, she knows it's respectful, and she knows a lot of people she loves like it. So um, that that's good enough for me. I think that's about as far as I'm going to get. Yeah in that. Uh, no, no. I mean, she had a lot of trouble with the, um, the aforementioned unauthorized biography. She, um, she, she by, by, called Mockingbird, she was very um, unhappy, I think, about that and did make some effort to, uh, if not stop, then have some things removed from it. So, back there. Um, yeah, uh, according to Michael and Joy Brown, um, her agent, Maurice Crane, who by all accounts was this fantastic, colorful character, she, Harper Lee herself, always wanted to call it To Kill a Mockingbird. He said, well, don't tell that right away. Whatever you do, don't give them the title they have. And so, <laughs> so they kept it as Atticus until the very last minute when suddenly everyone started, is there anything else that we can call it? And then, so, then she ponied up To Kill a Mockingbird and it worked like a charm. <laughs>